Good morning. 2017, am I right? <laughs> this has been a really, really crazy year. Um, it's been a year of basically watching a lot of stuff we took for granted kind of crumbling. Um, you know, representative democracy, uh, <laughs> freedom of the press. Um, uh, you know, it's been, it's been really upsetting. Um, we're looking at, at a crisis happening in the Caribbean right now. Um, and we're looking really at a crisis of, of faith in our information systems that's happening um, at the same time. So another thing that crumbled for a lot of us that work in the digital inclusion space is um, faith that getting people online was inherently a good thing. Um, and that was because we started seeing a lot of evidence in 2016, 2015 even, and really a lot in 2017, that people getting online, especially people who were from marginalized communities, communities of color, um, different, different groups that were already experiencing um, difficulties in the real world, they were getting harassed online. We saw Gamergate, we saw Gamergate turn into Breitbart, uh, and some of the tactics that they used. We saw fake news. Um, we saw that fake news outperformed real news. We saw that there were 500 million shares, at least, of fake news, according to at least one researcher, Jonathan Albright, who's at Columbia. Um, and you know, keep in mind, when you think about all of that, that the election was really decided by 78,000 votes in Pennsylvania. So, what are we gonna do? We have a profoundly polluted digital ecosystem and it's too big. Um, and so the answer is, is not, um, we're going to not get people online. It's too, uh, it's too important to be online. We've just heard a lot of people talk about all the opportunity that's online for economic, social, civic participation. So what's the answer? How do we make our digital ecosystems more healthy. Um, so this is what I've been working on. Um, as soon as I can figure out how to advance a slide here. Green button. The green button. That worked, yes, okay. So we started with a really simple idea, and this is what um, Gordon was talking about, which I uh, talked about at Meeting of the Minds in 2014. And that was, what happens if people build their own telecommunications networks? Um, and it sounds like kind of a silly idea, but actually we thought, okay, let's give this a try. If digital ecosystems are too big, let's try building smaller ones. And let's see what happens when people take this into their own hands. Um, and it's sort of a gamble. The question is, if people really understand telecommunication systems, if they understand networks, if they feel like they have the power to make their own information ecosystems, what will happen? Um, and so we started with about three neighborhoods in Detroit, and we started with one neighborhood in New York City, and that was Red Hook. Um, and so we partnered with the Red Hook Initiative there, and we built a little DIY mesh network with a few little nodes. And when Hurricane Sandy hit Brooklyn, um, all of the major telecommunication systems failed, but this little DIY community mesh network kept working. So we thought, hmm, there's something there. Um, and so based on that, um, we approached uh, the New York City Economic Development Corporation. They were running a competition for resilient technologies. And we said, hey, we did this thing in Detroit. Um, and we did it in Red Hook. And in Red Hook, it worked. Um, and so why don't you guys let us do this in a few more neighborhoods? And so what we did was um, we ended up finding community partners in five New York City neighborhoods. These are all in the flood zone. So if you see the orange on the map, that is the, uh, that's the, the sandy, in, sandy inundation area. And so what we, what we looked for in our community partners was we looked for organizations that don't traditionally do preparedness. They don't really do resilience work per se. Some of them do. Um, but some of them don't. What we looked for was organizations that ended up playing a really important role in their communities during Sandy, because they were there, because they were trusted, because people knew them. Um, so for example, The Point 
in the South Bronx. That's a community organization that is in a really stressed area of the Bronx. It's a tiny little neighborhood that's right next to the terminal market, which is the biggest market for meat and fruit, I think, in the world, um, and distributes all the food for the tri-state area around New York City. There's this little neighborhood nestled right by it, and the trucks just constantly go through the neighborhood. It's got the highest asthma rate in the country. And so the point said, um, great, we'd love to build a mesh network. Could we put sensors on the network so that we can take readings of the air quality in our neighborhood? And we were like, yeah, absolutely, that's a great idea. And each neighborhood had an idea like that, something that was from the community that they wanted to support with their network. Um, and so we've been working since 2016 um, with, these, with these neighborhoods. And we've been following the, the principles of the Detroit Digital Justice Coalition. So back to 2014, when we did our workshop at Meeting of the Minds, one of the things that we talked about there was um, working at a scale that's organic. So a neighborhood scale, and how does that work? And how does it work with community? How do you build technology that expresses the value of your communities, or the values of your communities? And we looked to the Detroit Digital Justice Coalition because they had done something really interesting, um, which was that when they decided all the different groups that were working on food justice, environmental justice, um, all kinds of social justice, they decided they needed technologies that expressed their values, technologies that they trusted. And so they came together and they said, okay, we're gonna create a principled, uh, a principled approach to technology. And that meant they took the environmental justice principles of 1991 and they basically reshaped them to fit technology. So those principles are access, participation, common ownership, and healthy communities. And these are the, the principles that we apply to our work in New York City as well. Um, and I'll just say, in terms of scale, in Detroit, they are now, um, the Equitable Internet Initiative is uh, run by D Diana Nucera, who co-presented co with me in 2014. And that's bringing gigabit fiber to three additional Detroit communities. Um, and then our project in New York is bringing mesh networks to five communities. So we are scaling but we're doing it in an organic way. Um, so this is a mesh network. This is sort of a diagram of a mesh network. Um, and there's a couple of things I wanna say about this. Um, you know, we, like, I'm say, like I was saying, we try to take a principled approach. We try to make technologies that fit our human relationships, not that shape our human relationships. So we wanna make sure that these technologies are supporting the social networks of support that already exist in these neighborhoods. So an example would be um, in Detroit, there was one neighborhood where um, they had lost their recreation center, they had lost their libraries, they had lost their schools. Basically the neighborhood was not gonna be serviced by the city government anymore. And there was a woman there whose name is Mrs. Leonard. And she decided when they closed the library, she decided kids really needed a place to read. And so she opened up her living room and got a bunch of books and her house became the library for the neighborhood. Um, now Mrs. Leonard, when we came to her neighborhood and said, hey, um, would you like to be part of this project? She was the first person who said, absolutely, I'm going to host a piece of equipment at my house so that we can build a community mesh network together. So if you picture each one of these routers, these devices on top of these buildings is a Mrs. Leonard. It's a person who says, I wanna be part of this. I believe in what you're doing. This is in line with my values. I mean, the secret of doing this is really that 95% of building a social technology is social. The technology is just like a hammer or a screwdriver. So mesh is a resilient technology because it's distributed. It moves the the data and traffic around in a distributed way, so there's no, it doesn't depend on any centralized points of failure. Um, but really the resilience is about the people. So this is just some of the resilient features. But again, yes, there's, these networks are solar and battery powered, but you need to have a social plan in place for who's gonna actually change out the batteries and when. Um, the networks have two modes. If you have an internet connection, it can distribute the internet connection so many people can use it. If you don't have an internet connection, the network can provide local services. So these are community 
design community made services. One of our uh, partners in Sheep's Head Bay, New York, he has designed an app for his neighborhood that's kind of like Seamless or Grubhub, where you can order food and have it delivered to your house, but you can only order from the restaurants in your neighborhood. And the money is retained within the neighborhood, and the app also asks you if you want to donate to a local neighborhood cause. So it's social. And local stewardship, we train people in each neighborhood where we work through our partner organization to build and maintain the networks. So it's all about them and their presence and their investment in the neighborhood. Our local workforce, they're called digital stewards. These are folks that anyway sort of like technology, they like tinkering, and we make sure that they get a stipend and that they're trained by the local community organization with um, curriculum that we provide. And so this young woman in the blue shirt who's putting up the mast in this picture, her name's Catherine Ortiz. Um, she was trained as a digital steward by the Red Hook Initiative back in 2012. And now she's working for me and teaching 30 additional people in New York City how to build and maintain networks. Um, and it's not just about work, it's about fun too. So um, the other thing that we like to do is um, the Disco Techs, which is a discovering technology fair. And at these occasions, people learn how to do all kinds of stuff from 3D printing to like making LED throwies to um, one guy made a really cool game where you, it, it was like competitive browsing. One person was using HTTP and the other person was using HTTPS. And um, you competed to see how much data you was being harvested from you. Of course, the lower score won. Um, that's a nerd joke, so <laughs> we may get it. I can explain later. Um, but the <laughs> in, this, in these pictures, you see folks, um, the woman in the red shirt is um, designing a mesh network for her community that's in um, the Far Rockaway. Um, actually, those are both in Far Rockaway. And the, the folks on the other side are um, crimping cables, which is one of the funnest things you can do in making networks where you um, basically put an, an, a cap on the end of a fiber optic cable. It's incredibly fun for nerds, um, but also for everybody. So the idea with the discotech is that um, the learners, the people that are learning at the station should be able to take over and teach the next person um, what to do. So as we were doing stuff like the discotheques and building in our neighborhoods and teaching people this technology, we kept um, making the technology smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller and shrinking it. And we kept, th we started thinking um, the smaller that we make, make it, the more it's going to be able to be distributed. So this is a platform that we made. It's a standalone communications platform. These started out as repair kits for our New York City networks. This was going to be a thing that uh, the stewards could take out, out, out into the field if a, if a piece of the network broke down. Um, and then it ended up being the best teaching tool. So we started getting the word out about portable network kits, and you can go to pnkgo.com to see what they are. Um, and then we, were, we had some friends in Houston. It was actually a Harvey survivor who called us up and said, hey, you guys, you really need to send these things to Puerto Rico. Um, they're battery powered. They're small, they're portable, you can set them up anywhere. And so we started training folks in New York City um, on the kits, folks from Puerto Rico. And right now we're trying to send as many kits as we can to Puerto Rico so that people can start building their own networks. And more importantly, they can do it in a way where uh, they're reducing dependencies and they're changing the relationship of power in terms of who owns the information, who controls it, who makes decisions about it, where does the data go, whose data is it. So these are all really small sort of acupuncture, tiny little ways to change the way that we think about technology and data. I don't think that mesh networks are gonna take over the world. I don't think that this is going to be the answer to all of our connectivity problems. I do think that mesh networks can help create resiliency and they can change our fundamental relationship to technology um, so that we don't feel like it's controlling us or shaping our relationships. So I believe really deeply that resiliency is a transformative process. It's not just returning to a previous condition. And so what I hope, that, what I hope happens in the neighborhoods we're working in New York 
in the neighborhoods where my colleague Diana Nucera is working in Detroit, is that people become resilient in a new way because they, they claim their power. And they claim their power around resiliency, around technology. You know, but I'd still have a fundamental question that I want to leave you all with. If our personal data is the fuel of the digital ecosystem, can it ever be a healthy digital ecosystem? And how do we change the fuel? How do we make it different? How do we change the incentives in that market? It could be around aggregating demand in the way that we're trying to do by building last mile infrastructure in our neighborhoods. It could be about demanding that, um, that we create resiliency through building relationships. There's many different ways it could happen. I don't have the answer, but I think with all the great minds in this room, we could start to change that fundamental relationship. Could take a movement, who knows? Thank you all.